And so this is looking at the changing mortality and the changing prevalence of congenital heart disease. And so this is over a 20 year period, you can see that most mortality went from infancy to adulthood. Most patients with Fontans are now over the age of 30. When you look at the prevalence since the year, um, right here, 2012, there was equal numbers of pediatric and adult patients. By 2030, two thirds of patients are gonna be adults and there's an increasing number who are over the age of 60. And so these patients for the first time have both congenital and acquired uh, heart disease. We now have two dimensional information. We have three dimensional information. We have four dimensional, which I like to think of cart, uh, you know, hearts in motion. We're able to look sort of inside vessels and do sort of what we call angioscopy. And we're now getting to the point of doing physiologic imaging. This is an example of FFRCT. This is a patient of mine who was 45, had an anomalous right coronary artery and had an abnormal FFRCT uh, showing uh, ischemia. We're also able to look at MRI tissue characterization and flow. And so I think we have a lot of tools now that really can help us with the both anatomy and physiology of congenital heart disease. So when we look at comprehensive risk in congenital heart disease, the first thing is we need to have an accurate diagnosis. When you think back to those ASDs, they were taking the patients to the operating room with the wrong diagnosis. And so we really need to make sure that our diagnostics are accurate to give our interventionalists and our surgeons the best infirmary um, available. And CT and MRI are almost never for screening in congenital heart disease. And so almost all the time, they have complex disease and you're doing the study for a specific question. Uh, the current ACHD guidelines recommend serial screening every one to five years for moderate to complex disease. And so when you think about that, you wanna do a very targeted exam for the clinical indication to decrease their comprehensive risk throughout their life. Um, for sedation and anesthesia, for the older CT scans and for the MRI, we used to do a lot of sedation. But with the newer scanners, the image acquisition is so quick that it's very rare to need sedation even in pediatric patients. And then one thing we'll talk about is radiation exposure. So in summary, I think CT radiation dose is greatly reduced compared to historical estimates. Um, education and um, technology are equally important. The DLP is the most objective measure of scanner output, and I think that's what I've been looking at um, primarily. The links to cancer are multifactorial, but I do think that that intrinsic susceptibility really is one of the things we really do have to use dose optimization in the as low as reasonably achievable um, principle to decrease the risk to our patients now that they're living longer. So in terms of recommendations for CT and clinical practice, it really, ever since 2006, all the way up to 2020 with the newer guidelines, it's listed as appropriate by every society for evaluation of complex congenital heart disease. And I'm gonna show you, um, these three cases have happened within the past year, and I think it's fascinating. So typically when you're doing a coronary image, you just are looking at the single interval that's gonna give you a picture of that coronary artery. But when we have had patients with exertional symptoms in the past year, we've actually done a functional CT, and this is actually looking at a patient, here's the Lecompte, pulmonary arteries anterior to the aorta. These are the reimplanted coronary arteries. They're actually, the reimplantation is beautiful. But look at this. This is the coronary during the cardiac cycle. And so with um, systole, the coronary really is between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And with maximal exertion, when you have systemic PA pressures, you can start to get compression similar to an anomalous left. And this is another, so we started thinking about that. And this is a patient who came in, 13-year-old male, he had transposition, he did have coronary anomalies, but had an arterial switch doing great, no symptoms whatsoever, and then he's playing basketball and has a V-fib cardiac arrest. So he comes to the hospital, gets a catheter presentation, coronaries are great, and they said, well, let's get a CT just to make sure, this is like three days later, and I said, you know, I think that this coronary could be compressed by the pulmonary artery with exercise. And so at the time, um, when I first got there, we were doing perfusion MRI with adenosine, which I think is gonna be normal because your proximal coronary looks fine, and so we actually took them to the adult hospital for people who know how to do really good stress tests. And um, he had symptoms, ST changes, and wall motion abnormalities at heart rates above 160. So this is another case where the proximal coronary is patent, but with exercise, he is having compression. And so I think that's an important thing to note. And then one other case of that, this is actually an 18 year old with L-kappa. And so he had an anomalous left coronary from the pulmonary artery. You can see here that the surgical um, site is gorgeous. Your coronary is absolutely wide open. Here you can see the origin. Um, but again, you can see the coronary right here is between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And just how we talked about for AAOCA, that an interarterial course is at risk for sudden death. You know, we're actually creating an interarterial course as part of our repair for some of these patients. And so I think this is something um, just to be aware of. If you have someone who has exertional symptoms with a history of coronary manipulation, we've started doing functional CTs on these patients to actually look and see is there compression or changes in the relationship with the coronary artery during the cardiac cycle. So as far as endocarditis goes, I think that um, we all know now that pulmonary valve 
has a lot of endocarditis, uh, more common with uh, melody than sapien. And the other thing is that the endocarditis risk for melody valve just keeps going up. You never sort of hit a plateau. And this has been shown in multiple studies. And then if you have a residual gradient over 15, your risk for endocarditis is much higher. And so we published this with six cases in Minneapolis, and we actually, five of these patients had systemic emboli as well. And so the reason that CT, I think, is, is nice is it's complementary to echocardiography. Um, the RVOT is very difficult to visualize because it's sort of, you know, where it is, um, you can't really see it well by TEE or transthoracic. It's useful for periannular complications. And then when you look at the uh, new updated uh, infectious uh, endocarditis criteria, it now says echo or CT. So CT is now considered a major criteria. And this is a couple examples. This is a patient with a double switch. So here is the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. What you can't see is the venous baffle behind there. And so her echo actually looked okay, but this was her pulmonary valve endocarditis, and you can see the vegetation's in here. And when you look at where this pulmonary artery is, it's really kind of diving down, and you can imagine you would not get good echo pictures. And this is another patient with a melody valve, and you can see here the correlation between the CT image and what they found at surgery.